Welcome to the American Society of Plastic Surgeons webinar on social media. I am Heather Furness. Let's start with choosing your social media platform. When you choose your platform, as we'll see on the next slide, um, you'll need to define your goals. Let's start with choosing your social media platform. If we could have the, the next slide. The, um, the, your goals may be to connect with colleagues, to read or watch what's new in plastic surgery, or to attract new patients, or maybe to engage with established patients. The second thing you need to do is to identify your audience, and that's really going to be dependent on your goals. So let's take a look. If your goals are to connect with colleagues or to read or watch what's new in plastic surgery, Who's your audience going to be? Well, it's going to be our professional societies and our journals like ASPS, PRS, ASAPS, ASJ, et cetera, as well as other plastic surgeons. Now, if we take a look at one of my posts, you can see that on July 10th, I posted about this social media webinar. So I was broadcasting this to an audience of other plastic surgeons. This is not a post that would attract patients. And if we look at the next post, this is a post that I made about an article that I recently published in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. So this, again, is something that is reaching out to my colleagues, as well as uh, PRS and ASPS. If we take a look at the images that I posted, you can see that they have a lot to do with conferences, colleagues, a few of my patients, but this is not a feed that is going to attract uh, patients. If we look at our next, you can see that because I'm reaching out to colleagues and societies, they're my audience, but I'm also their audience. And so I will frequently go to the Facebook feed of ASPS. And here we see an announcement of a Facebook Live uh, production with Dr. Joe Hadid on July 11th. And then I tuned into ASPS uh, Facebook's feed a few days later, and I was able to see this post of Dr. Hadid's uh, very good Facebook Live, and um, I could connect to that video. He actually dis discussed the latest trends in male plastic surgery. So if this is something that I want to promote in my practice, this would be a great uh, post to share. Now, if we look at the video feed, the video page on ASPS's Facebook site, we can see a variety of different topics. So maybe I'm not emphasizing male plastic surgery, but perhaps I'm doing breast reduction and I can find a good video to share on my feed. Now there are some that will some videos that will be common to all. If we take a look at the next uh, screenshot, this is a great video that ASPS did, and it describes the uh, the very difficult uh, trajectory of this patient who had injections of filler by a non-plastic surgeon. She ended up quite deformed. She was quite beautiful. She saw Dr. Reza Jarahi, who really reconstructed her. She's extremely grateful to, um, to Dr. Jarahi and really sees the distinction between a board-certified plastic surgeon and, uh, and those who are not trained. So this would be a video that you might want to post on your feed. Next, we can see on, also on ASPS's feed this uh, link to a blog about laser hair removal. If we click on that link, we go to the ASPS website and we can see there's a blog about laser hair removal, and it's written by Dr. Ramanadham. And you'll hear from her very shortly. So this is really informative. So if I do laser hair removal in my practice, I can share this blog. Dr. Ramanadham can uh, ask that the link to her practice video be included. That can serve as a backlink for her and increase the authority of her website. So I encourage members to provide blogs about clinical information.
that can help all the members, patient education, as well as our own websites. If we look at our um, events page on ASPS, we can see a list of the upcoming meetings. So and ASPS's uh, Facebook page is very, very helpful. They're my audience, but I'm also ASPS's audience. Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery also has a wonderful presence on Facebook. They share really cutting edge things. They uh, provide videos. Dr. Rourke makes excellent videos about hot topics. Uh, if we look at the video page for PRS, we can see that there are and there's a great selection. We can click on PRS Grand Rounds. We see authors describing um, the interesting topics about uh, articles that they've written. So there is a wealth of information here. This can really benefit you professionally. Um, we can come across articles. Like in our, our next uh, post, we can come across articles that we wouldn't uh, otherwise perhaps read. And, and then in our um, next post, if you yourself write an article, you can post it on your own feed. But, uh, but if it's published in PRS, uh, Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery is very active on social media. They'll post it as well. I created this image and they were um, very kind enough to include that image in this article about uh, gender differences. And then finally, there is um, PRS Global Open. The real um, benefit of Global Open is that all of their articles are open to anybody. And so you don't have to be a subscriber so these are really helpful to post on Facebook if you see that there is a topic that might be of interest to the general public. Now, if we go on to our um, Instagram page with PRS, we can see that they have a lot of great posts, images, videos. They are not able to post links to their articles, but it's really informative and, um, and I learn a lot from the Instagram feed. So now what if your goals are to attract new patients and get engaged with established patients? Who is your audience? It's gonna be very different. And even the type of practice will determine your audience. Do you do, do, you do breast reconstruction or transgender surgery or aesthetic plastic surgery? Okay. So to look at how to figure out where your social uh, media platform of your audience is, um, that was actually the topic of this paper, Social Media and the Plastic Surgery Patient. Uh, my co-authors and I, looked at aesthetic plastic surgery patients because that is the makeup of, of my practice. If we look at globally, the next slide, we can see that Facebook is the, the towering giant of social media, uh, followed by Instagram and Snapchat and Twitter, less so. So we might think that you know Facebook and Instagram might be the place to go. We can also look at the demographics in our next slide. We can look at... Um, the age range, the gender preference, the type of posts of each of these, but most effective is to actually ask your audience. And so that's what we did. We asked our patients and we asked them to indicate how often they use each of the social, social media platforms that we have in our, in our practice. They, we ask them to indicate, I don't use it, monthly or less, weekly, daily, several times a day. And in the graph here, the bar graph, you can see the towering blue bars mean that uh, patients don't use those uh, apps. But what we want to look at are the orange bars, which indicate daily usage, as well as the red bars indicating usage several times a day. So we, if we look at the extreme left, we see that Facebook is the big winner, just like our global audience, and Instagram comes in second, just like our global audience. So now we know we want to be on Facebook and Instagram. So let's look at um, a, uh, the type of post that people want to look at, what interests patients. The, we decided to ask them about 13 different types of posts, what would be of interest to them. And the top three 
were before and after photos, practice information, and contests. And we can take a look at our, our next slide. So you can see here is a post that we made about a before and after of a, uh, an abdominoplasty. Practice information would be just obviously information about a, a practice contest might be, guess this, uh, implant size, or it could be a Halloween contest. We've asked people to contribute images and have a contest on Facebook, and that's been a lot of fun. Um, now let's take a look at the next slide. So we've I've talked about interacting with colleagues and attracting patients. Those are very different audiences. So you might want to consider having two different accounts. On Facebook, I have a personal account, which is set up as a personal account, as well as a practice account. And that's set up as a business page, which is really like a small website. You can see a menu on the left. Let's take a look at the next slide, get a little closer look. You can see this is the home page, the menu on the left, and in the center is our cover video. If we look at our next page, we look at the videos, we can see at the top our cover videos, and then just below that, we can see a menu in our um, next slide of all of our videos. We show a variety of videos, we show different treatments, we have and uh, staff talking with patients about different products. Uh, we have feel good posts like Father's Day. We show the surgeons in surgery. So we really try and share the culture. And we can also um, click on reviews. And in reviews, you can see that in that uh, little 4.5 star, we have a collection of one stars from people who we've never met. And see, so we like to balance that out with actual patients who have left five-star reviews. So reviews can, can be helpful and informative to um, people visiting the website. Next, we can list services. So this is a, a really nice option. You can just describe briefly what either a surgical treatment or a non-surgical treatment is about. And you can also include before and after photos. So this can give people a good overview of your practice. And we also hold events in our office. So uh, the viewer can click on events. And just like ASPS shows our, our conferences, we have our in-office events like I have listed here, Cool Sculpting Fiesta, Spring Skin Event, the Virtual Body Event, etc. Next, we can um, tell people a little bit about ourselves. We can tell people our hours, our history, a little bit about the surgeons, show a map, and give, give people sort of a global look at our practice. And then if they're interested, they can click on virtual tour. And so this will, this camera is, I've got a screenshot of our operating room, but the camera will take the viewer through all parts of the office. So they really get to get a, a, a sense of who we are just through our Facebook page. There are also forms on Facebook, including request an appointment, as well as a newsletter sign up. And so you can see that Facebook is very rich in what they provide as a, a website. Now let's take a look at Instagram. Instagram offers both a personal as well as a business um, page. This is a business, it's much more stripped down than Facebook. It doesn't have the depth. We can only put one URL in Instagram and that's in the bio here. So we have a link to our website. We have the usernames of the doctors, our phone number. The business page allows you to connect directly to make an appointment as opposed to a personal page. Uh, uh, for personal uh, page. Now, if we look at the bottom um, in the, where the circle is blue, we, can, we put in some videos. If we look next, we can actually provide our own virtual tour. Even though there isn't a menu option for a virtual tour, we can say, welcome to our Santa Rosa office. The viewer can walk inside. These are screenshots, so they're a little bit blurred. And next, people can see a 
our reception area. They can take a look at one of our exam rooms. And next, they can say hi to Dr. Canales and Dr. Furness. These are videos, so we're, we're um, in action. And next, um, they can see our amazing team. And then we can uh, provide some fun facts. Dr. Canales holds a master's world record in freestyle swimming, and Dr. Furness is an artist. So we can share a bit of our culture with, uh, with the viewer. Now, if we look at that, go back to the home page, we can see that it's really image rich. Instagram is about videos and photos. Um, I mentioned that that survey that we did, and when the, the, the top three winners as far as type of posts was before and after photos. And if we go to our top posts on Instagram, we find exactly that in our next um, slide. You can see these are our top posts. So people really are interested in what patients look like before and after, what we're doing in surgery, and, um, and more than, than anything else on Instagram. Now, if we look at our next slide, we can see here's a before and after photo. Now, this image is one that one of my patients recently brought in and showed me and said, this is why I'm in your practice. I love this photo and I wanna look like, like her. We have found that Instagram is more likely than any other app to be the source of patient referrals. It's, it's um, more likely to refer patients than Facebook. Our Facebook posts are only viewed by two to 5% of our followers. So even though we have a lot more followers on Facebook, it's not viewed as much. Instagram tends to be viewed by about 10% without boosting or, or putting ads in. So, so Instagram has really been a great hook. In this before and after photo on our last line, we put, can you guess the implant size of the patient? Here we say on the next one, um, the Botox one, uh, have you tried Botox? What do you love most about it? So we like to ask a question it gets people to look at the images a little bit more, engage, offer uh, comments, um, because that's really what we're after. It's social media, so we want to be social. In our next slide, we have Jules in our office showing Elta. This is a still shot, but in the um, in the text it says "swipe left to watch a little demo," and so we provide a video. So if we look at our overall grid of photos, we can see that there is um, a real artistry to it. Some people will, will choose to will, uh, schedule their posts. So the, the left column is all before and after photos. Some people will choose a monochromatic theme. So there's really a lot that you can do with Instagram. We take a look at my own Instagram page. This is my personal page. It's a lot like my Facebook page. I um, post uh, more things, uh, uh, conferences, personal photos. Um, it's really about colleagues and friends, not so much attracting patients. So now that you've chosen your social media platform based on your goals and your audience, you need to write posts that create interest, Post videos worth a thousand words and measure your return on investment. Next, we're going to hear from Dr. Ramanadham, who's going to tell us about writing posts that create interest. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Furness. Um, good evening, everyone. So tonight we will uh, talk about how to write a post that creates interest. I have no disclosures. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So before we begin, um, we really need to understand what the fundamentals of social media are. And I'm really going to bring it down to the basics. Like Heather had mentioned, social media is social. Um, and this seems like a silly um, thing to think about. It's stating the obvious, but it's really important to remember this. Um, it's a conversation. Content needs to be created by the brand and the consumer. And it really relies on this interaction to be successful. Um, consumers really need to take the information that they see. They need to think about it, process it, expand and react to it. And then they need to spread it within their networks. It is quite the opposite of traditional advertising, which is a one-way street and it's unidirectional. Here, 
the content is created by us as the brand and it's directed to the consumer or audience and they really don't have to engage in any way for it to be successful. And so really if that fundamental difference is not understood, it really will result in a lower ROI and frankly, little progress in building your network and reaching your goal. So on to the next slide, how does this all work? Since social media does rely so heavily on the consumer as much as the brand itself, how do we encourage them to participate? How do we recreate this two-way street? And so we really need to pay attention to these three aspects, traffic, engagement, and conversion. We need to generate traffic by generating content that impacts the consumer. It needs to be something that they react to, and more importantly, something that they care about. And if they care, they'll then engage. They'll share, they'll comment, they'll tag their friends, they'll like your posts or click on links, and they'll really begin to spread this content within their network. And that really increases the number of people that are attracted to the content and the number of people that are exposed. And finally, you'll, this will result in conversion. They'll perform the actions that you ask of them. And whether that's to increase sales, patient volume, exposure, all of this can really be boosted if social media is used successfully. And in order to really accomplish this, there are other things that we really need to think about. So we need to think about what our goals are, who our audience is and understand what motivates them. And then you can start creating this content, uh, this content that generates interest and increases your ROI. So the first question to ask yourself is what is your goal? Why are you even doing all of this? And the goal really can be any of this, to increase awareness and safety within plastic surgery, to educate our patients, to entertain, increase sales or patient volume, improve an experience or increase website traffic. But really only you can decide this based on your practice and what your goals are. And once you do decide this, all of your content needs to be strategically planned so that this goal is accomplished. It needs to be consistent, it needs to be unified, and this will really give your brand an identity. And that identity is vital. Otherwise, you will completely get lost in the chaos and shuffle that's social media. So it's really important to remember that social media and all of these networks are tools that allow you to reach this goal. Um, and they're, they're not the end result. So social media is great because it can open doors. It can allow you to shape your brand and how your brand is viewed by the public. And it really allows you to leverage the consumer or the patient's opinions, um, which is unique. So the next question to ask yourself is who do you want your audience to be? It's important to identify this early on. So um, if you're building a facelift practice or you want to attract patients, you want to maybe target your upper class um, women, men, 40s, 50s to 70 year olds, or, or are you trying to build a breast augmentation practice? and you want to target your 20 to 30 year old uh, patients. Ultimately, the goal is really to get a group of like-minded people who share and care about your brand. And they'll be interested and engage with you. And once you determine that, you can then really target and create your content for them so that they will react to it. Once the audience is identified, you must then choose your platform. And the various platforms differ as we've heard by Dr. Furness. And so it's really important that you are putting your content out on the right platforms. Otherwise they will just never be seen by the audience it's intended for. And finally, you must post on these platforms at the times when your target audience is active. You post often, but not too often. A lot of these various platforms have uh, recommended frequency of posts. So for example, um, Facebook, Instagram recommends one to two posts per day. Twitter, about 15 tweets per day. Um, so you want to post at a good frequency and also when the platforms are most heavily accessed. So now that the fundamentals are down, that's really only half the battle. The main question of what we're here to talk about today is how do you then create content that attracts attention? The average consumer is literally flooded with content daily, but you only have the time and the attention to pay attention to a small fraction of that. So how do you how do you make your content stand out amongst everything that's out there? And the key really is you need to know and understand your audience. 
that's probably the most important thing you can take away from today's talk. You need to almost create this buyer's persona when you're writing your posts. So you post what your audience is interested in. They're likely to pay more attention if your content is relevant to them, impacts them in some way, or evokes some sort of positive emotion. So for example, content on common interests or hobbies that they share are powerful. Storytelling that is emotional or po fosters positive feelings also tend to be successful. And this really makes them think and more importantly to react and then act. Um, additionally, any content that has practical value is popular. And this is part of the reason why top 10 lists are so great. Um, you want to offer them valuable information, information that they can't find elsewhere. You really want to become their resource and you want them to turn to you. And finally, you really must encourage the consumers to act. Ask them questions, ask them to post, ask them to visit a website or share or comment. Whatever your goal is, you really want to just ask them. And this is so important because consumer generated content is actually viewed as being more authentic, more valuable and trustworthy than the brand itself. And people are more likely to listen if it comes from someone within their networks or an influencer or some sort of trusted person. Um, there just unfortunately tends to be this innate level of distrust with the brand themselves because a lot of times they view us as just trying to sell something. Um, but over time, with more engagement, the brand does become a trusted source. And as with anything, trust is earned and it's not easily given. So since practical value is so successful, here are a couple of top 10 lists of what to do and what not to do when creating um, posts that have interest. So first, you wanna publish on a regular basis at the right times and on the right platform. Additionally, you wanna refer your patients or your consumers between your different platforms. So for instance, on Instagram, you might post something about a YouTube video that you just posted. So you want to direct this traffic um, between the platforms. Use headlines and subheadings that attract attention. They need to be catchy, provide new information, be surprising, emotional, promise some sort of benefit. And this is really where you can be a little risky, um, but you need some sort of hook. 80% um, of your of the consumer will read your headline and only 20% actually go on to read the content itself. So it's really important that your headline is compelling enough that they look further. You wanna be visual. As we'll hear soon, videos are very important. Um, you can use memes, be colorful, eye-catching, whatever you need to do to grab your viewer's attention. Um, be positive. Emotional headlines and stories work incredibly well. Nobody wants to hear sad stories or de be depressed or hear about complaining. Um, so posting that content is, is not helpful. Use hashtags. And this is really a great way to connect to a larger discussion and to link content. It's more important on certain platforms, for instance, Instagram and Twitter than others, but that's something that you can definitely um, play with. Um, next, you want to provide invaluable content. Do your research, provide information that's not easily found elsewhere. So we're all experts in plastic surgery. And so that's what we should be talking about. Um, and this really forces the consumer to turn to you and you become their resource rather than them going somewhere else. You want to be personal, use conversational language, speak to the audience directly, use you in your, um, in your post. You want them to see that you're a real person and that you're having a conversation with them and that they're special. Um, you wanna be authentic. You are representing your brand. Um, and so you want the patient to know you and that's how you develop trust. And that's how they become invested in you, invested in the brand. And then they're more likely to share your content. Set the tone and be excited about your content. Excitement is contagious. And so you want your your audience to be just as excited as you are. You want them to be invested in your brand. Um, and finally, involve your audience. Ask them questions, get feedback, post action-oriented content, give them some sort of reason to act now, give them an offer. Um, and then you wanna study this data. You wanna see which posts are popular, um, which posts the consumers react to, and then post more of those. 
So now not what not to do. You don't want to be too professional, too knowledgeable, or use a corporate tone. Nobody wants to feel like they're at school being lectured to. They want to feel like you're their equal. Um, don't plagiarize. Google actually checks this. So it's really important that you do so as well before um, posting. And there's multiple apps and websites that you can use to run your content through. Um, don't just share content. You want to curate it. You want to expand on it. You want to add your personal touch to it. And it's always great to link back to the original content. And don't write to a large group. Like I said, this sounds impersonal. You want to talk to the person directly. Don't write to impress the audience. This can be really annoying. Um, so you want to actually write to express feelings and thoughts so that you can also motivate the same in your consumers and your audience. Don't publish what you don't know. As stated before, you really should be publishing invaluable data and you really need to be the go-to person. And so you're never gonna be that if you're posting things that you're just not well-versed with. Um, don't write what others are already talking about. You need to be original. Um, social media is ever-changing and you, if you're not original, your content just won't last the test of time. Um, don't use bots, don't buy followers, this isn't authentic. And don't write about yourself or your own needs. Nobody really cares. So the success about of social media is really to focus on the audience. This is you want you want to write posts that they care about um, and that and what they can benefit from. And the more they see a benefit, the more they're likely to engage with. And finally, you don't want to be scattered. This is really why a goal is so important. You need to be unified and you need to have this unified voice on social media so your brand really can stick out. So I'll conclude with a few take home points. Um, in order to write posts that create interest, you need to understand the fundamentals of social media first and really what drives the consumer. It's not only sufficient to create content that attracts attention, but you really must keep it and it really must pass the test of time. And engagement is vital. The consumer is just as important and I would argue even more important than the brand itself. So you really, once you have your goal, everything should be directed at the consumer's needs so that they'll engage with you. And really without that engagement, you won't have a successful social media presence. It's always important to do your research and evaluate your ROI metrics and get feedback from the consumers themselves. We have to remember that social media is not static, it's constantly changing. And so your content should also change depending on what the data shows and what the consumer wants. And lastly, we need to remember that social media is fun. It's everywhere, everyone is using it. And we really must have a presence as a unified profession. Um, social media is just so great because it really does bring the world to our fingertips. We just have to be able to use it right, take full advantage of it. So that concludes my talk. And next I will have Dr. Karen Horton will be talking to us about videos. All right, thank you. So my topic today is a video is worth a thousand words. Tips and caveats for plastic surgeons. Next slide. So why is video so important in plastic surgery? Well, our specialty is visual and the public really has a fascination about what plastic surgery is and all the intraoperative details. They're getting it elsewhere on TV and on other social media channels and they really want it from us because we are the main experts. Next slide. So how do you start video if you've never done it before? Well, you just have to start. Uh, start small. Be brave. If you can be a surgeon and if you can do surgery, you can definitely do video. Be comfortable in your environment. Uh, video is where the public, which is really our patients, are spending their time. And you know the saying, you go where the money is or the business. Really, you need to go where the patients are, just like you've heard from Dr. Furness. And if you could click on this quick video, here's a short example Recording of a video is actually I did. pretty easy. You probably don't want to do it on a volume. Sunday when you're in your running clothes like me, but just to show you, you uh, go to the camera function, 
press record and you can see whatever you On the want. screen is a video that Afterwards, I took on Sunday in my kitchen. To review it and <laughs> edit it and there's different programs. Just an example that you can take it anywhere. Phone, but there's also some That's fine. We don't have sound. Maybe we can get sound it. on the next video. Anyway, just to show you can really take a video anywhere. So planning is key. You really don't want to miss an opportunity. And before you press record, you really want to have a plan about what you want to say. Otherwise, you're just going to sound very scattered. You can map out your planned topics for the month and the week. For instance, if you do a lot of skin cancer stuff, there's Melanoma Monday. Every single Monday, you can post or do a video about melanoma. Breast Cancer Awareness Month, that's a really big one. In October, it's all going to be about pink ribbons and broad A. And then also you can promote your special events by video. You want to be consistent and you really want to be your best. As was stated before, you want to maintain a consistent message, a demeanor, your tone, and your brand. And you're going to say like, why? I'm, what's my brand? Well, actually, you, you are your brand. Uh, video is the absolute best way to get your message across using your own words on your terms and in your individual voice. You want to be fresh and energized before you start recording and you want to be your very best self at all times. And if you click on this video, there's a video of me educating about drains. I tend to do my video recordings in the morning. All right. I'm going to talk to you about drains today. Maybe we can get sound this on this one. This is a drain bulb. And if not, that's fine. You get the idea. The I do have a caption and it talks about, I'm talking about drains. I'm doing a show drains and tell. Really I'm showing the drain bulb. It says my name. And the, the purpose of like this uh, video was to be educational. But also if you do a little show and tell, it'll capture interest. this part comes out, say, you know, under the... So no sound. Well, that's too bad. Uh, next slide. So Instagram videos are a good place to start. I'm, I'm doing Instagram <laughs> live at the same time. Uh, so this is where a majority of our patients are spending their time. So we should really focus here, as we've heard before. To record an Instagram video, I said swipe left, but it's actually from left to right. You want to swipe right on the homepage and you want to turn the camera around to start a video. You can record a short boomerang, a hands-free, or a live video like this one. If you click on that little video on the screen, that's just a short little uh, boomerang. I don't normally type with my one finger, but I'm holding the phone with the other hand just to show this is one little thing I did when I was working on my slides. Next slide. So then there's also Instagram boomerang video. So if you click on this, this is me obviously decked out for 4th of July. Our colleague, Dr. Rod Rohr, Rohr definitely has Boomerang figured out. You can download the Boomerang app for free on the iTunes store, and it's also uh, embedded within Instagram Live. And it's a really fun way just to do it like a short, silly video. Like here, I'm showing my spirit for Canadian. I was the best dressed um, person at the 4th of July parade. But you really don't need to talk if you're a little shy, and you really don't need to be that clever. And you can just show a little, little side of your personality like this one. So Instagram Live, which is actually I'm doing live right now to whoever's watching, because I figure you might as well, might as well get two, two for the price of one out of this. Instagram Live invites all of your followers on Instagram to watch you, to wave at you, to comment, or to ask to be part of your video as it's ongoing. And you can really talk about whatever you like. You can add cute filters or text. And when you're ready to end the video, it took me about three tries to figure this out. Make sure that you click on save because if you don't save it, then it's gone forever. So when you press end at the very top part of the screen, press save before you press share. And then you can add a short clip of the video only about 30 seconds to or 30 seconds up to 60 seconds to your Instagram homepage or your Instagram stories later. And if you don't post it on that day, it just shows up with the date. So if you click on that video right there, which I recorded on July the 11th, all right, I'm doing. It's like there's no sound, video. but I'm basically being self-depreciating and saying like third time's so a charm because I, I finally figured it out. <laughs> and I think great. if you're just when you're recording hi. video, if you just I are yourself, you know, you don't be too and stiff. Then, you don't, you know, you just got to show a little bit of your personality. It it really shows through. The next slide. So Instagram stories. If you're on an Instagram homepage and you see on your on the Instagram home, you see all these little circles with people's names. Those are stories and many Instagram users, people that I know and friends, they don't really go to the homepage and scroll through. They just look at Instagram stories and they uh, do that to get a snapshot of what people they're following are posting rather than checking out individual feeds. Instagram stories are short video or photo clips that run for anywhere between like five seconds to 30 seconds. 
It's cute because you can add text, which puts it in context. You can add hashtags, which makes that Instagram story searchable. You can add the location. Say you're at a really nice restaurant, you do a little shout out to them, emojis and stickers. And so if you click on this little video, it was a really cute one. I got a really nice uh, note of thanks from a patient. So I said, word of thanks from a plastic surgery patient. And you have to be really careful. I zoomed in, as you can see, and then you have to have enough time so that someone who's actually interested in reading it can read. And of course, I blacked out the patient name. So even if you're camera shy, this is something that you could do and you know you get good press out of it. You can share a patient's happy and his or her own words and it's, it's a really nice thing to do. Next slide. So next are Instagram story highlights. And those are, if you look at your own feed or somebody else's feed who's really active on Instagram, those are the little circles. And you can actually highlight your stories. After you publish a story, you can highlight it. And the purpose of that is it keeps the story up longer than just the 24 hours it would normally be there. And it encourages additional viewing after the story has expired. So you want to be selective. You don't want to highlight everything. Um, and it's a really nice way. See, the last one, when I did a screenshot here, I um, did a little thing about ASPS social media promoting this event. So that's where the story highlights come in. So next is Facebook Live, which is essentially what we're doing now. Facebook Live is another way to allow your Facebook friends on your personal page and your Facebook followers on your professional page they get invited to tune in and watch your video as it occurs. They can like or love what you're posting. They can use emojis. They can comment live and ask questions. And if they do ask live questions, this can allow you to directly answer their questions or comments in real time. And then you can save this video and share it on your Facebook homepage or other social media channels. So I'm just going to do a little shout out. There's another um, Facebook Live event tomorrow. It's at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And I'm going to be on there uh, talking about plastic surgery for men. So if you want to learn more and see another live video, it's video number two. And it's been found that Facebook Live videos get the most press. Facebook users have been found to spend 300 time, 300% more time watching live videos than traditional ones. These videos are going to be promoted to all of your followers and friends, and they really get center stage when they're live, like this webinar. So it's a really great way to really get the most bang for your buck. And, you know, obviously you do it for free, but you'll get the most press out of it. Next are Snapchat videos. Snapchat, as opposed to some of the other face or other the um, sorry the other social media platforms that are a little bit more strict, you can post whatever you want on Snapchat. You don't need to cover up nipples. You don't need to cover up buttock creases or genitalia, and the videos are only ten seconds long. So you can piece them together, but it often feels disjointed. I think that people that do a lot of Snapchat video recording, they just get really good at it and they only talk for like nine seconds. And then in the next video, they talk for nine seconds more. So you can put them together. I think in order to do this, you have to know what you're gonna say and be really concise in those 10 second blocks. Unfortunately, Snapchat has gotten a bad rap from some very bad behavior. And it's often not from American Board of Plastic Surgery, uh, certified plastic surgeons or ASPS members. If you are going to be recording videos on Snapchat, and if they are of good quality, and if they have a worthwhile message, then it's reasonable to share them on your other social media channels and also on your YouTube channel. So speaking of YouTube, you should really set up a professional YouTube channel. It's free to do, and you can add all of your videos from all of your sources onto this one channel. Um, this can include, um, you know, TV events, but be careful if it's a syndicated TV station that you were fe featured on, they may own that content. Um, it can be any of the videos that you record or, you know, say they did a, a feature story on a local TV station uh, with permission, you can share that on your YouTube channel. And YouTube does allow for a slightly more revealing content, such as surgical details, nipples, and it is really excellent for patient education. If you like to record little snippets of surgery and do a voiceover, it's a perfect place for it because when patients are researching surgery, they often go to YouTube and they're so fascinated and they just, they want to see the surgery. So if you are recording your surgery, you might as well be the one posting it there because they want to see you do it and hear your narrative. And it's really good for longer videos. Other social media platforms do have time limits. 
you can add tags to your to make your video searchable like rhinoplasty and remember that patients are not searching rhinoplasty they're searching nose job or they might be searching boob job deep flap or whatever city you live in and you need 100 followers of your channel before you can have a personalized domain name so i only have 40 followers so far um, i wanted to make it slash dr karen horton you just need to have 100 followers so we're working on that next is twitter and you've heard a little bit about twitter already from dr Furness. twitter in general i think is probably less pertinent to attracting and educating new patients but there are subsets of special interest groups like breast cancer patients breast cancer providers i tend to use twitter a lot at professional society meetings and it's a really great way to promote scientific journal articles, they're often primarily, primarily shared on Twitter. I think that Twitter is a really good go-to platform to share what is happening real time at that moment. For instance, this video, if you click on it, uh, somebody in the audience kindly took a couple of videos of me speaking at a conference and she posted them live and it was so great because if anybody was interested in what's happening with whatever hashtag for the meeting is, they can just click on that and I'm there. So it's a really great way just to do promotion. And as a plastic surgeon, it shows that you, you know, participate in education, you're collegial with colleagues, and it's it's a really nice way to do that. But you're not gonna get patients from Twitter videos, probably. Video should also play a very significant role on your website, not just social media. It's been found that videos keep website vid visitors engaged on your website longer. And the longer that the viewer spends on your website watching and listening to your videos, the more valuable your website is seen by search engines like Google. And this can increase your Google ranking organically. It was estimated that by this year, at least 79% of internet traffic will be video. And I do believe that it's heading in that direction. So how do you record videos for your website? Well, you can do it for free. All you really need is to turn on the camera and start talking after you've planned, after you're groomed. And really my best advice is pretend you're in a consultation. And if you're not comfortable talking right into the camera, have like a dummy, have like somebody from your office, not that they're dummies, but have a dummy person sitting in your office and just talk to that person. Pretend you're in a consultation and consider what are your three most common procedures? Cause you really, you already have your script down. You probably say it several times a week. Don't worry about stumbling on your words or feeling embarrassed because you're human, you're not an actor. And I think that the less scripted you seem, you actually seem like a real person. The goal of videos on your website, which I recorded a whole bunch yesterday, it's to share educational and valuable content and to talk about what you know, you're the surgeon. By being imp imperfect and unscripted, as I said, you'll come off as a real person and possibly an approachable surgeon. Viewers will see you as somebody that they could envision themselves in trusting to perform their plastic surgery procedures. So I do um, encourage everyone just to start recording videos. Drink some coffee, pretend you know what you're doing. So who does the filming and how much does it cost? Well, if you click on this video right now, I did this on Sunday. I went to the San Francisco, um, what was it called? The Renegade Fair. And um, on this video, I just took a, a little recording of things that I bought. I bought a new little plant for the bathroom. I'm like, oh, this is nice art. It's a breast and there's heels, which I wear in the office. And there's a really cool, um, you know, background of a toilet. It's like bathroom, bathroom art. So you can do a lot of video recording and editing for free. Beware, because there's many companies that will approach you, especially if you have a new website, and they will offer to produce your videos for $500 to $3,000 a pop. And this can actually really add up. I would start small and first see what you can do on your own. Don't commit to working to a company without referrals and a commitment to quality work and also a very timely turnaround. So what's the ideal setting to record a video? Well, you wanna record your video in a quiet location without loud noises, without patients coming in or office staff, phone calls. And if you're in the hospital, like you don't want the fire alarm to go off, especially if it's a live video or other outside noises. You want to have very good natural lighting whenever possible because really lighting can make or break the shot or the mood. Good lighting and good sound are really more important than a good camera. You want to be interesting and honestly if you're not feeling it don't force yourself to record video because it'll totally come out that way. 
you want to change the scenes. You don't always have the same office background behind you. It's boring after a while. And then there are some professional green screens available and some group plastic surgery practices have uh, invested in this recently. You can add the background later. That's not what most of us are doing, but if you are recording a lot of video and if you do have a budget for that type of thing, sure, why not? Other tips for video recording. Well, you always want to look professional. Even if you're in scrubs, you want to brush or comb your hair, you want to brush your teeth, you want to put on a smile. That's the most important thing. You want to aim for solid colored tops rather than very busy and distracting prints and especially stripes. If they're viewed on a computer screen, they, they kind of warp it. And you really want to capture video in the moment. Record what you see around you or on the weekend. Say you go to an art gallery and you see like your favorite work of art or something that reminds you of plastic surgery when you're on vacation and also in professional settings because your videos don't always have to be medical and related to surgery. Remember that what we find acceptable and interesting like surgical details is usually disgusting and offensive to the public. So record you know, what you see, and it gives a little snapshot as to what, what's your aesthetic and what's your personality like. Before you share videos, make sure that you review them and you edit them before you post them. And this is pretty easy to do either on an iPhone or other smartphones. Many videos are too long and they will lose the viewer's interest. There are some apps that allow you to either splice shorter videos into one. Um, you can speed up a video. I know time-lapse video is really popular to see details of a surgery. And then you can also add your logo to the bottom or your watermark. On Instagram, you can choose the cover image and this avoids the opening shot with you blinking or grimacing. Um, Instagram videos are limited to 60 seconds. So I'm still working on this, but try to say the most important thing in like at least the first 20 seconds because then you got it across. Facebook does allow longer videos and YouTube has the longest video time. And you always wanna be polished for recording. If you are planning on recording multiple videos, consider having your hair and makeup done professionally, even the men. Uh, yesterday, I actually did record a bunch of videos and I had hair and makeup done and honestly, it's way better than I look today. It's just such a nice polishing touch. It'd be nice to look like that every day. A little primping actually does go a long way to having a polished and put together appearance. Make sure you clear your desk of messy paperwork, ensure the flowers in your office are not dying, <laughs> and consider setting aside a half day for a video project. I like to record videos early in the morning, um, if you're a morning person, which probably most surgeons are, or whenever you're feeling the most alert, awake, intelligent, and enthusiastic. That's really important. So what do you talk about in your videos? Well, talk about things that interest you and that you're passionate about whether it's rhinoplasty or craniofacial surgery, hand surgery, breast surgery, Botox, you're the expert and you should really share your expertise about the things that you do and that you see every day in your own words. You can also follow your colleagues who are also active on social media and that are sharing videos, but make sure you don't copy them. Take what they are doing as an inspiration and then record your own videos with your own personality, your style, or your twist. Here's another example. It's not playing. That's fine. Happy move on. Friday. I'm working I'm tired today. Of that one. But the most important off. thing I want you to see is they I'm smiling. You always want to smile because you don't want someone who looks most of them stodgy or stressed. We can offer Just be happy. to patients in the office with them awake under local I anesthesia. What I, was I think I was talking about what I was doing that day. I had like 10 minutes before I was starting to see patients. Today, I'm, doing I'm like, oh, the lighting's pretty the good. And a gentleman. I think I'm talking about liposuction of the neck and a man there. For a couple different patients. And I'm also moving the lipo. So you also want to stay in your comfort zone. Here's a little boomerang of me getting Botox. You see the little marks on my forehead? I'm totally fine with that. Not everybody would be. Um, I think it's important to, as a, as a female surgeon and somebody who offers Botox in her office, I, you got to practice what you preach. But don't try to be everything to everyone and don't try to be something that you're not. If you're comfortable talking in front of the camera, then go for it. Um, if you're not, but if your patient care coordinator or your nurse is comfortable, then maybe have them share your message with you walking around in the background. That's called B-roll. You want to draw on your specific skills, but don't force it. Consider having tasteful snippets of surgery recorded, and then you could do a voiceover on your own time, you know, at home, at your own pace, and, and explain what you're doing and why. Patients find that really fascinating, and this can be scripted and, and done later. And some people really like to do that. 
So what about filters or costumes? Well, filters are cute, but I would consider using them sparingly. Really, you should always show your professional side. Please never wear costumes in the OR, please. And with filters, would you want your plastic surgeon to look like a bunny rabbit or a monster? I don't think so. Save those filters and silly selfies for your private life. Um, now I have two little, two little images and I have a little video here that I uh, posted on Halloween. It was actually really funny. This is actually a 10 year old kid. And it was so, it was so cute. I said, oh my God, he's really scary. I just thought it was funny, but I made sure everybody know it's Halloween. And it puts it in context and it shows I'm out with my kids. So a little, a little bit of your personality coming through. And I think that's fine. When including patients in your video, be sure to follow HIPAA guidelines and have solid video consent. Even if you have a completely cosmetic practice where theoretically HIPAA doesn't apply, you want to have full consent and you want to get this written consent before recording. Offer to have patients view the video after it's recorded and edited before you share it on social media. And there is a copy of a photo recording consent in the four member section of plasticsurgery.org. I took a variant of this and I modified it to include video. This is a copy of the consent form that I used yesterday. And I included both my name as the surgeon, but also the photographer and videographer. And make sure that you include any other specifics about where the videos will be used. You wanna capture video patient testimonials and really to emphasize the journey. So you're not gonna be able to hear this patient, uh, that video will play in the background. Uh, but if patients express how happy they are, like say they come for I their you know, three month follow up, oh my God, you know, Dr. So-and-so, you changed my life. Invite them to share that experience in a video. And I think it's important to emphasize to them the patient journey and encourage them to get that across in their words and how they can use it to educate others. While their identity would be revealed, like this patient, her, her name is right there, and she did a video for Broad A, she felt more comfortable covering her face. You know, it's kind of like the Halloween costume brings out your best self. And for her, it was, it was amazing. Um, many patients are really eager and willing to record themselves talking about whatever procedure they had. If they're not comfortable talking with their face showing, maybe you could do an audio recording and put it together with some images in your office. So you want to capture patients while they're in the afterglow of their procedure and when they are so happy and they just want to tell the world about what a great experience they had. But also be aware that patients may change their minds and that you may be asked to take the video down in the future. So how do you plan for video recording? Well, you wanna make notes about what topics you'd like to record when you have the brilliant idea. So for me, I use the iPhone Notes app. If I have a brilliant idea, I'll just do like an audio recording and say, you know, these are the bullet points for a video that I think would be interesting. And if you don't have any ideas, have a brainstorming session with your staff or your family or your friends and ask them, what, what do you wanna hear about? Because what you think is boring or routine, like washing your hands at the scrub sink or planning for a routine procedure that you do every single day, it's fascinating to patients. And think about what a lay person would wanna know and share that. And if you don't know, ask lay people what they wanna know. And you can draw on these topics later when you're drawing a blank about what to talk about. And don't try to cover too many topics at once. You wanna make sure you always save your videos. You wanna catalog them and then share them strategically. So here's a little video of microsurgery. You can record a whole series of videos all at once and then schedule them to be posted through a, a third party site. Categorize them into their main content. And when you're posting, make sure you add comments, hashtags to make it searchable and a short summary message to not only make the post searchable, but also to get your main message across. Otherwise, people just look at that and it looks gross and they have no idea what it is. But if you include hashtag microsurgery, hashtag deep flap, hashtag breast reconstruction, all of a sudden people will see it. And if you narrate it or add a little context, it's amazing. Try to aim for one main message per video and explain what people are seeing and also why, because otherwise it'll just look gross. Beware, nipples and genitalia will get you into trouble, specifically on Instagram and Facebook. Interestingly, female nipples are not allowed, but male nipples are fine. And I don't know the answer to transgender. If you do show nipples or genitalia, your videos will be removed and your account possibly could be suspended. And Facebook jail is real and it's painful. 
If you have a first offense, you get a notification and you're, you are blocked for 24 hours. And blocked means you can't post and you can't comment, but you can still view things. If you have a second offense, it's three days. If you have a third offense, it's seven days. And if you have a fourth offense, I'm not sure, but I think your Facebook page could be taken down. So also the use of emojis to cover nipples and genitalia is widely practiced and it's somewhat controversial. If you are gonna use emojis like I have in that picture on the screen, consider plain symbols such as circles or squares. And please avoid suggestive emojis like a kitty cat over a woman's pubic region or an eggplant over the penis. Everybody knows what it's you know, supposed to mean and haha, but it's just not professional. It's in bad taste. So use your best judgment. When you're recording your video, you really want to be concise and you want to be brief. The shorter the video, the better, generally speaking. People have short attention spans, myself included. So you want to stick to just one topic per video. And follow the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. Be conversational and talk to your audience, even if the audience is a camera, in terms that they can understand. Treat each video like a consultation. Be tasteful, be relevant, be authentic, and be kind. And follow each social media platform's guidelines because it can vary from site to site. Vary your background and use props. So if you click on this video, you see the first thing I did was I hold up, I held up a canister of liposuction you know fat. And I said, do you know what this is? That's right, it's liposuction fat. Did you know that over 70% and uh, last I heard was 80% of videos on social media are viewed without sound and from mobile devices. And if you're just a talking head, it's boring. So viewers will click, quickly move on if you don't hold their attention. You wanna make the video visually compelling. It needs to be well lit, again, lighting is key, with good audio, don't record it outside, with a pleasing background. The use of props like breast implants, before and after photos, surgical instruments, they tend to spark interest. And there's a reason why I was holding up that canister of fat the whole time. Um, the sound will, more, will be more likely to be turned on if viewers wonder what you're talking about. And since videos on social media have no sound, unless they're clicked on, you basically have to opt in to sound. If you have a caption, like, you know, turn on the sound to hear what this doctor's talking about, it's, it's a great way to capture the audience or just say, you know, liposuction, learn more. You want to let them know what the video is about so they're more likely to listen in. So which video format is best? Well, Instagram live videos and Instagram stories are vertical, like this one, although that one just flipped. And then YouTube and Facebook videos are sh shown horizontally. Um, try to format videos in a square shape. And what I mean by that is, you know, you don't know, even if you record it um, vertical, have most of the action in the middle so that if you wanted to, you could crop it and it could be shown horizontally. And you want to try to choose a compelling image for the cover of the video. And on Instagram and YouTube, you can actually slide the little bar and choose a little thumbnail. And also consider watermarking your videos to avoid content theft and to give you credit if it is shared. Next slide. Slow loads and really long videos are just a killer. Uh, videos need to load quickly, either when they're embedded on your website or when you're linking directly. Make sure that when you're recording, you have strong Wi-Fi to avoid the video and audio being off. And you also wanna keep your videos short and sweet, as we said a couple of times. You wanna to get to the point, make it engaging. And remember, no one is gonna stick around to watch even a five minute video, except maybe your mom. So in summary, when you're using video in your plastic surgery practice, remember, it's really not that hard. And a video truly is worth a thousand words. It's your opportunity to get your message across in your own words. Consider all the non-professional, non-board certified plastic surgeons out there. They're all over social media. They're posting like crazy about cosmetic surgery and they're getting a ton of press. And if they can do it, you can. We as a group of board certified plastic surgeons should strive to post educational, responsible videos about plastic surgery. Our voice and our video posts will hopefully help drown out the irresponsible and sensational accounts. Thank you to all the ASPS social media experts for contributing their pearls of wisdom to my video. And next up we have Dr. Manas 
Chrisopolo. He is going to be talking about ROI, which stands for return on investment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. When you develop your social media strategy, and we've heard a bunch of uh, great tips on how to do that already today, um, at the end of the day, it, you've got to find out if it's working, otherwise it's a complete waste of time. So constantly assessing your performance, I think is key. Next. So it, it takes time. It takes time um, to get things going. It takes time to maintain it. Uh, you may be investing some money uh, as well. Um, so budget allocation is something you're going to want to uh, hone, hone down. Um, sometimes uh, folks will be outsourcing. Um, so but even in that situation, you'll, you'll still want to define your voice, your brand, um, and really get a good grip of uh, the basics. Uh, otherwise, how do you know that uh, your outsourcing is worthwhile? And there are also tangible costs. Um, if you're really going to get involved with social media, um, you, you really can't do it without being willing to engage. Um, and, and, you know, that involves an emotional quotient of sorts. It's, it's effort that's really difficult to quantify. But if you're not prepared to, to put that effort in, then maybe you should kind of think again. Next slide. So ROI or return of investment is the metric that everyone talks about and uses when defining performance. It's, it's usually expressed as a percentage and is typically used to compare profitability or to compare the efficiency of different investments. And it's a very simple formula. Uh, but what it means exactly to you and how easy it is to track depends on your goals. And so, like we've heard already uh, a couple of times uh, tonight, you've got to define your why. So, nebulous goals uh, such as you know, improving public awareness are obviously going to be much harder to track than more quantifiable goals like the number of new consults, conversion to surgery, or, or revenue. Um, so but ultimately, define your why first before you do anything else. Next slide. So the why, um, you, you need to determine the trackable outcome measures uh, once you determine those goals. Um, and then you introduce the internal processes that you need in your office to track those outcomes. So. Your front desk or other point of initial patient contact is going to be absolutely crucial. Um, the generic question, um, who referred you, is quite useless, actually, uh, because um, even if folks have found you online, uh, ultimately they may seek validation or, or a person or a physician, so they give you a physician's name, when really it was your Instagram account that uh, was the reason that they really made you get in touch, uh, make them get in touch. So, you know, what made you get in touch is a much better question than who referred you. Um, and keep things very simple and basic to start off with. So let's say you're starting to use Facebook. Um, number one goal is to ensure you capture all the referral sources of new patients. Um, then you, you're going to divide the revenue generated by patients coming from Facebook by all the money you spent on Facebook. Uh, multiply that by 100, and there's your ROI. It's pretty straightforward. Next. You're going to have some challenges, though. You can't do this alone, and you need the buy-in of your team. So typically, that's going to be your office staff. Um, if they're not bought in, and if they don't make it their mission to ask each person who calls what made them call, you're never going to determine your ROI properly. Um, the other issue is multiple platforms. Uh, these platforms are constantly updating. Um, it's difficult to, to track sometimes um, in terms of the analytics. It's much harder than a website where you can insert some code. You can't insert code on, on, on your Twitter account. And so when you've got multiple platforms and multiple different metrics to follow, 
getting an overall holistic view can be tricky. Next. Regardless of the social media platform you choose, uh, each platform will provide you with, the, with access to basic analytic reports. Um, so tracking your social media performance within each social media platform is the best first step uh, that you can you can make really and it gives you some key uh, but basic metrics like engagement on each post you know who's who's reacting to it how they're reacting to it um shares uh, that sort of stuff next so starting with facebook it's it's our uh, biggest um presence online at PRMA, you know, we're primarily a, a breast reconstruction practice for 95% breast recon. Um, our exact demographic is a little bit different to cosmetic plastic surgery practices or 100% or, or cosmetic practices. Facebook does very well for us. Um, so it's really at the forefront of our social media efforts. Now here you can see the insights on the top bar. Uh, so you click on that. Um, and then it gives you uh, basically a nice overview of what's going on with each post. Um, and you can compare the level of engagement and, and the, the type of post and how well each post does. So inspiration and human interest posts always do very well. Um, so as you can see here, that Sunday inspiration post that maybe took you, you know, 10 seconds to post did better than anything else on this screen so you've got to mix it up like we've already heard next uh, twitter uh, again the insights are there on your profile uh, you, you click on that um, and then it takes you to a, a pretty basic page that shows you uh, your impressions your engagements uh, for your tweets uh, your, your replies and, and and you can drill it down and see which way you're best performing tweets next instagram uh, again uh, from the main dashboard you have uh, it's one the insights or analytics are one click away instagram does have some downsides in terms of the analytics the reports can only be viewed within the app itself uh, you only get a seven day snapshot um, which obviously that removes the ability to to compare uh, timelines and, and so really for a much bigger picture, you need a third party um, analytics uh, platform or software. Next, um, YouTube again, insights are there, easy access. Um, it, there you are, now you click on that and then you get the basic, you know, stuff that you wanna know for your videos, average view duration, you know, how long are people hanging around uh, before they, uh, click off. How how does that compare to the length of your video? Uh, do you need to mix it up? Do you have to throw in some props like Karen said? Uh, it's constant analysis uh, to get better at what you're doing. Third-party tools uh, are going to come into the picture. The more you get the hang of things, it gives you a really good overview of, of all your accounts in one place. Um, and then you can drill down to the specific posts or campaigns and then look at much much broader time horizons than you can within the apps sprout social and hootsuite are, are the two probably most common um, that you've got a bunch to choose from uh, varying degrees of uh, cost from 19 bucks up to over 200 per month um, these are good to have even for the for a, a solo practice uh, but they're particularly helpful for practices that have a lot of social media profiles. You know, we have seven physicians. Uh, we have a main account for our practice, and then we have individual accounts for the seven physicians. So it gets kind of tricky monitoring. So we can't, we couldn't do it without a third-party tool. Our tip for the top is Sprout Social. Next. So this gives you just a quick glimpse as to uh, the dashboard within Sprout Social, but it, 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 this is our main Twitter account uh, at Deep Flat Breast, um, and it uh, basically uh, it's overview of uh, the performance, including the likes, the retweets, replies, and the overall engagement. Next, 
Um, although it's not technically a social media analytic tool, you can use Google Analytics to see how much traffic comes to your website via each social media platform, and then how the user actually behaves once they get to your site. Um, you can track in response to different social media campaigns um, and see which ones are most successful uh, at moving the users to and then throughout your site. Uh, and then you can also track specific conversions and ad campaigns. Um, here, if you look at, uh, it, 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 this confirms the, the amount of traffic we get from our Facebook uh, account compared to all our other sources. I'm personally very active on Twitter. I like I like Twitter very much. It, um, so that gets a fair amount of traffic too. Instagram there is number six, um, which is you know th these results are completely different to a lot of to most cosmetic practices. But what's interesting is you compare the bounce rate. The bounce rate is when someone is sent to your site how many of them hang around and how many of them just say, ah, this isn't for me, and they, and they leave, bounce. Um, so the lowest bounce rates, so the lower the percentage, the better. You know, Instagram is 50%. That's, that's a very low bounce rate. Um, so, and then uh, you also look at the pages, the number of pages someone uh, explores. So you see that the Instagram uh, visitors basically uh, spend more time on our website. So I, I used to think that Instagram, um, you know, was there was a disadvantage to only having the link in your bio, but this basically shows you that yeah, I was wrong. Instagram is great, generate the interest, send them to that one link you have, and um, you know, you're, you're off to the races. So uh, for us, it's, it's challenging because, uh, Instagram does very well for cosmetic practices, and we're only now really exploring it for breast recon, but we're quite excited about, it, especially with the Instagram stories. Next. Um, so, uh, again, um, a little bit drilling down a bit into Google Analytics. Um, this breaks down the, the traffic sources to your website, including the various social media platforms. Um, it shows you the top sources. And here you can see that uh, Google and Facebook um, are uh, pretty much our, our top referral uh, sources. Um, and Google Analytics allows you to compare uh, how you're doing in terms of uh, meeting your goals. So you've defined your why, and you can have several. And one of our goals is getting patients to uh, complete a virtual consultation form online um, if they're interested in breast reconstruction uh, to see if, if we can help them. And that way, uh, they can uh, decide whether they, they want to come see us without traveling. We get a lot of folks from out of state so traveling is a big deal. So this, this really helps um, our online efforts and conversion. Um, what's interesting here is you see that there were no, no completions of our form on July 7th and June 30th. You know, we're comparing these two time periods, both are Saturdays. So why was that the case? Was it because Saturday is a bad day for filling out forms? Or, you know, what was going on? So you have to go back and check the posts that went out. Uh, on, on Saturday and uh, try and find out uh, what's going on. But th this is the power of, of, of analytics. Next. Um, as uh, Dr. Furness mentioned, uh, organic reach is shrinking. So it used to be that you post on Facebook and all your followers see your contact. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, all platforms are trying to maximize monetization by having you pay to maximize the number, of eyeball, uh, the number of eyeballs that see your content. So boosting now uh, is in vogue. It's a form of paid advertising. It is cheaper than regular ads. Um, but it, it, it's, it's a very effective way of getting uh, your message out there uh, now that the organic reach is shrinking. You know, for us, it's very worthwhile in terms of ROI, and this is a better ROI than Google. Uh, paid ads for our practice uh, specifically. 
So when you identify the content that's working well for you, you should consider boosting it to maximize its exposure. Facebook will actually suggest boosting when a particular post is performing 80% better than others. And, and the image there is, is just the message you get. That's the message I get in my email. Um, if you're going to be on Facebook, I, I really think this is something you, you, you need uh, to consider uh, very strongly. It's also offered in various uh, forms on other platforms. Instagram allows you to promote your profile and individual posts. Um, YouTube, you can promote the, your most popular videos via in-stream or in-display ads. And uh, Pinterest also allows you to promote your most popular pins. Next. So you identify your post, you click the boost button, right there, bottom right, next. And then um, here, um, this pop-up uh, will appear. You've got the option of selecting a pre-saved target audience, which you, you can actually manage that in your Facebook advertising account, uh, or you can create a new audience. And then you've just got to assign your budget um, and the duration that you'd like your boost, your boost to run. Uh, and you've got, a, you know, you can do a week or, or a couple of weeks, whatever, whatever you want. Um, and then um, you click boost and uh, that's it. Next. So before you get going though, you've got to uh, take a benchmark to, uh, so, so that you know where you started. So you've always got to be able to refer back and know uh, where you started. Um, you know, it, it, it's easy. I, I, you can always do it retros, you know, retroactively, retrospectively, but it's far easier just to do it. Uh, you know, pick a date uh, and then write down where you are for all your existing accounts, um, especially if, if you're looking at certain goals. You know, where are you for those goals right now? Uh, so, you know, take it, take it beyond just the number of Facebook friends you have. Next. So ROI is a very powerful weapon, you know, in your online marketing arsenal. And now you know, or you should know all these things, how many patients are reaching your practice via each social media platform and the outcomes based on the internal tracking that hopefully you've set up within, within your practice. Um, so in terms of calculating ROI, it's, it's very straightforward, like we've said, uh, especially if you're looking uh, at a quantifiable metric or it, it needs to be a quantifiable metric. Uh, most surgeons are obviously going to be looking at revenue. Um, and then the key is combining the tracking processes you set up in the office with the online analytics. Um, so let's say you start using Facebook. Thanks to the tracking you've set up at the initial point of patient contact, you know how many new patients have come from Facebook. You divide the revenue by the uh, generated by these patients, uh, by all the money you've spent on Facebook, uh, either directly or indirectly, boosting ads or um, the third-party software or, or anything like that, multiply that by 100, there's your ROI. Really very simple. Okay. Next. So like you've heard tonight, in terms of your social media strategy, uh, this this really summarizes things. Once you've chosen the media platform, social media platforms that, that are best suited to you, you define your goals, uh, you work on how to post, curate um, content, and then you evaluate the performance in terms of online analytics. Um, you combine that with your internal tracking um of your of your goals uh and then that leads you to to the roi but then ultimately you've got to take it one step further and adjust your budget your budget allocation accordingly uh once you uh see what the roi is uh, for each of your efforts next uh that's all I have for, for you guys. Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Um, I'd like to thank um, uh, our lovely distinguished panel of uh, uh, ladies uh, that came before me.
um, Dr. Furness, uh, Dr. Horton, and Dr. Ramadan, and um, uh, ASPS for putting this together. And a shout out to, uh, to our main man, Kyle, for doing so much work to put this together. Thank you all very much.